Fiordland, New Zealand. A landscape that has a long story to tell. Today it is majestic, sculpted from eons of geologic activity and carved by ice. However, this area has been one of constant change. Researchers from all around the world are in Fiordland, New Zealand, trying to figure out what happened and when, hoping to piece together a history that has shaped and reshaped this landscape for hundreds of millions of years. As they discover the ancient mountains and magmas of Gondwana. Today, New Zealand consists of two islands, the North Island with its pristine beaches and geothermal springs, and the South Island with its lush green fields and picturesque fjords. It is here we find geologists from a number of universities from the US and New Zealand, traversing areas of untouched natural beauty in search of answers that can reveal many of this place's volatile and diverse history. Fiordland forms part of a large ancient um, continental arc, which is basically magmas forming along a, a long line where you've had subduction of one plate beneath another thicker overriding plate. And when that happens, you, you melt uh, deeper down uh, into the mantle and also the lower crust, and you produce magmas all the way along where the subduction zone has occurred. I'm Rose Turnbull, I'm a geologist in New Zealand's Geological Survey, or GNS Science. My specialty is an igneous petrologist and geochemist, which basically means I look at magmas, I try and understand magmas from deep crustal magmas that have crystallised into granites in the crust, all the way through to magmas that have erupted at the surface um, through volcanic eruptions. I look at the minerals that make up those different types of rocks, and I try and understand what those minerals represent um, and the chemistry of the minerals and also the entire rock itself and what we can use out of that to understand how magmas form and evolve and also how that relates to how continents form and evolve through time. Some of these rocks um, once formed part of uh, the supercontinent Gondwana and the oldest ones in New Zealand are Cambrian in age which is about 500 million years old. And at that time, all of the continents you see on the Earth today were once amassed in this giant supercontinent uh, called Pangaea. And the northern part was called Laurentia. The southern part was called Gondwana. And New Zealand was part of the Gondwana continent, uh, which split up about 100 million years ago in the Cretaceous. So it lasted a very long time. Um, and you can still see remnants of that here in, uh, in the mountains today. The geology present in Fiordland is unique to the conditions that created it. But what makes these conditions of such interest to these scientists? One of my main interests in studying Fiordland National Park in this particular area that we are here today is that it represents a deep crustal plumbing system of an ancient magmatic arc. So imagine that you are at the Andes, for example, today, where oceanic crust is subducting underneath South America. And at the surface we see volcanoes. But as you go deeper into the earth, there's a whole plumbing system of molten rock that's fed from the mantle below the crust into the crust. That molten rock is stored in magma reservoirs or magma chambers. And so coming here, we're able to see the frozen plumbing system of an ancient continental margin magmatic arc that's inaccessible today in a place like the Andes where modern subduction is producing volcanoes at the surface. And so in order to study the processes of how magmas are generated, how they're transferred through the crust, and how they're stored in magma reservoirs, ultimately leading to volcanoes at the surface, we need to find an ancient example where those rocks exist and are frozen in time and exposed at the surface. And so the unique combination of subduction along the western margin of Fiordland today, plus the fact that these rocks have been eroded away by glaciers very recently, allows us to come here and study these processes in great detail. Magmatism in, in Fiordland, as I mentioned, it's, it's occurring along this long-lived continental arc, but over that period of time, it's really been characterised by pulses or fluxes of various composition and also 
various volumes. So in the, the first episode of magmatism, around about 500 million. It's just a small amount of, of magmas um, occurring along the Gondwanan arc. And then there's a big gap. And then we get a pulse of magmas that have come up throughout Fiordland. And it's characterised by uh, a lot of crustal melting. So it's melting of um, sediments, sandstones and mudstones and other rocks like that. Stuff that's formed at the Earth's surface. And then that's gone down to depth, melting those sediments and giving the granites and um, other magmatic rocks quite a distinct chemistry. And then from around about 170 to 140 million, we get another flux of magmatism. And it's quite different in chemistry from the earlier phase. But then we get the big flux of magmatism. And this is our Cretaceous arc um, flare-up event, where we have uh, rocks forming from around about 130 to 100 odd million, give or take, where we get a lot of melting of mantle at depth, a lot of melt coming up into the crust and swamping everything else. And that's, so this is the tempos along an arc. Got long-lived magmatism, but it's really coming up every um, so often um, in these large magmatic flare-up events. This magmatism, coupled with deformation caused by subduction along the tectonic boundaries of the Australian and Pacific plates, have caused the landscape to be born and reborn. To understand how this process works, geologists must search for tiny minerals that can hold answers to some of Fiordland's ancient mysteries. And so what we did just a few days ago is we hiked up this mountain here in order to get to an area where we see the juxtaposition of different rock types and they're juxtaposed against faults. And so what we were looking for are the different rock types in order to take them back into our laboratory and study the timing at which those rocks crystallized. In other words, when were they molten and when did the crystals begin to crystallize from that molten rock? And then when were those rocks faulted and deformed and ultimately brought to the surface? And so to do that, we need a combination of helicopters to bring us to this very remote area. And then once we have a base camp set up, we have to hike up uh, several hundred meters in order to do traverses so that we can collect a transect of rocks along this very complicated but incredibly beautiful area. The rocks that we brought back from our traverse, we're going to take those rocks back to the laboratory and what we're going to do is extract the mineral zircon. Zircon makes up less than a percent of that rock, so we're going to bring back fairly large amounts, several kilos of this rock, to separate only a few hundred grains. And by separating those grains, we can use our laser ablation system to directly target these tiny minerals. They're smaller than a human hair, but we'll be able to observe them under a high power microscope in order to identify the concentration and isotopic ratio of uranium and lead in that mineral. That will allow us to directly date the timing that these crystals form from the molten rock. You can think of zircon as like a tiny time capsule that incorporates information about when it formed and the processes that have happened to that rock since it formed. We'll be able to determine so much information back in the laboratory. As Dr. Schwartz and Turnbull seek out zircons, others, like Dr. Harold Stowell, are seeking out the mineral garnet as it will give insight not only into the times in which these layers of rock were formed, but also the temperatures and pressures present at their formation, giving insight into the pace and types of magmas that played a role in forming this magnificent place. Garnet's a wonderful mineral in metamorphic rocks because it can tell us three things. It can tell us pressure, temperature, and time. Very few minerals can do all those things. So it's a fundamental piece of the lower parts of continents, and it's also found in the mantle. Therefore, garnet can be very informative in terms of the mountain building processes that I emphasize in my research. One of the most interesting aspects about geology today is that continental arcs like the Andes or the Japan, the Japanese arc, they didn't all form from a constant supply of magma. There are these periods in Earth history when there's a surge of magmatism. And we think that that's what happened here as well. The rocks that we're standing on formed during a surge of magmatism right before Zealandia broke away from Gondwana. And what we're trying to figure out is what causes those surges to occur? What 
magmatic events or tectonic events happen in the crust or even below the crust that lead to this voluminous production of molten rock that ultimately creates large amounts of continental crust. It's one of our unknown questions in geology, and we're here to try to solve that problem. The story of Fjordland has played out over hundreds of millions of years, and scientists are continually learning more about this process. As they continue their work, the next chapter in the story of Zealandia is the story of continental creation itself. As the ancient mountains and magmas of Gondwana have metamorphosed into something different over time, they have crafted a unique environment, but more, they've played a role in creating the newest continent on Earth, Zealandia.